Hey, how's it going everyone? I'm Carlo from All You Can Board, and today I'm gonna to be talking about seven new games coming out. These are upcoming games uh, that I am very excited about. Uh, some of these are gonna be coming out you know, shortly. Some of them might be coming out by the time you see this video. Other ones might be sometime in 2022 or whatnot. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump right in right with the first one. And to be honest, this might be the one that excites me the most of all these. And uh, oh, I wish I had looked up, there was a user uh, in one of our previous YouTube videos, credit to them for you know, letting me know about this game because I didn't even know this was coming out. And this is called Fire and Stone. So this is designed by Klaus Jürgen Vrede. You might recognize the name, which I'm going to get back to in just a second. Uh, with artwork by Hendrik Nowak, and this is published by Pegasus Spiel. It's going to be a two to four player game that plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. So the main thing right away that caught me about this game again is the designer, Klaus Jürgen Vrede. He is the designer of Carcassonne, which for those who don't know, if you you know haven't watched our channel before, or you might not have watched videos where I've mentioned this previously, Carcassonne is the game, the modern day game that kind of got me back into the hobby. You know, aside from the you know more basic uh, mainstream board games that I'd play as a kid. Um, you know, I'm I'm 33 now. I got back into board gaming when I was around about 18, 19, 20, somewhere around there, and it was thanks to Carcassonne. I had played it on the uh, sort of Xbox Live implementation and fell in love with it. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I haven't really played it much in the last you know four or five years, but it's because I got probably hundreds of plays in in that first five or six years when I was really falling in love with the hobby. Um, but it's just such a classic game. There's a reason why, you know, they're doing the 20 or they just released the 20, 20 year anniversary. Like to me, it's still one of those games that has very simple rules, but just squeezes so much depth and replayability out of them. It's a game I still would enjoy playing anytime, any day. Absolutely love it. And to be honest, it's the only game by this designer that I've ever played. He has designed other games, um, you know, I've been kind of curious about, but I've never really been quite as um, highly ranked or highly acclaimed. But Fire and Stone, it just sounds awesome to me. So the basic idea is that you're leading a tribe through the Stone Age, and you're going to be doing things like uh, scouting out new territories and then harvesting food, gathering resources and that kind of thing. So it basically is a map of the world, and there's gonna be areas that are divided into three different regions. So there's gonna be like region one, region two, and region three. At the start of the game, players will only be able to explore region one, and then there's little sort of timers built into the game with certain tiles being revealed or whatnot that allow you to suddenly, okay, now everyone can explore region two. And then another thing will happen, it'll say, okay, now everyone can explore region three. So you're gonna start off, every player will start off the game with one scout, which is basically your little worker on the board or your, again, your scout that's gonna move around, let you do stuff. And throughout the game at a certain point, maybe around the halfway point or probably a little earlier than the halfway point from what I understand. The rulebook is online already, by the way. I highly recommend you go check this out on BoardGameGeek because it's only like a five or six page rulebook. I read the, I read through it the other day and it totally sold me on this game. Um, but basically, you once you have your, your scouts or you're gonna start with one again, you're gonna be able to have two later. And the idea is that on your turn, you with, for each of the scouts you have, you first move a scout to an adjacent region and then you take an action in that region. So at the start of the game, and when you have two scouts, you'll do that with both scouts. So you'll move one and then take an action, then you'll move your other scout and take an action, and then it'll go to the other player's turn, and it goes like that until the game ends. So part of the setup in this game that, you know, it's a variable setup so that it's going to play differently. You're not going to be like, oh, this region is good for this, this region, or this area spot on the board is good or bad for this. It's going to be a variable setup where there's all these little discovery tokens that are face down. So when you go to a new place, you're going to flip the token over and it'll show you what type of spot it is. So it might be an animal location or a fire location or a cave location or um, there's a few different ones there, a settlement location. And basically every effect or every tile that you flip over will have a discovery effect that triggers when you first discover it yourself and then it'll remain as that type of location, and then there's an action effect that can be taken there. So if you go somewhere where the tiles already face up, you know in advance, I'm gonna go there and do this because you know what action you'll be able to take. But at the start, you're you know exploring these new lands and you don't know what's there yet. So let's say for example, you know uh, you get to a fire location. Well, if you don't have any animals, you're not actually gonna be able to cook the animals there. So you wanna have animals before you get there. Um, if you are the first one to a settlement location and you flip that over, you're gonna be able to build a hut. But if you go somewhere where there's already been a settlement and there's other players' huts, you can put a hut there too, but the cost is going to be higher. You're going to have to pay more food for the amount of huts that are already there. So there's kind of this exploration aspect where you want to be the first to certain places, but you don't know, like there's that randomness. You don't know what there's going to, what, what's going to be there. Now, one of the things that sets this apart, I mean, there's the common... What it has in common with Carcassonne is that you're doing this shared map kind of thing, but you're not you're not building it, you're exploring it. But unlike Carcassonne, you have your own little player mat where you can basically... Uh, store food, store your resources, you know, if you, you, once you have your extra scout and kind of thing. So, and one of the things I really like is 
Um, you're also going to be able to acquire basically inventions throughout the game, which is basically, uh, there's a big deck of these invention cards. When you go to certain locations, you're going to gain an invention, which is basically an ability that you'll now have for the rest of the game that'll say something like, you know, uh, every time you gain a food, you also draw one of these cards, or every time you discover a new place, you gain a food, or you gain a resource, or whatever. So every game you play, you are you can have a different invention, or different, you know, you can have multiple inventions, you just can't have two of the same one. So every game is going to play out a little bit differently like that. It gives you a little bit of asymmetry from player to player, whereas in Carcassonne, you know, everyone has the same, is playing by the same rules, you don't get anything unique that you have that someone else doesn't. Um, one of the things I really want to touch on that really intrigues me is the cave. So on the map, there's going to be one, like of those face down tiles, there's going to be one cave every time. And when that cave flips over, whoever discovered it is going to get access to something right away. And then other players can also go to that cave afterwards. But there's a stack of, I think, like 24 cave cards that are going to come with the game. And every time you play, you're only going to pick one of those. So every game... I mean, not every single, you might see the same one, obviously you played enough, but you don't know what that cave is going to be, but you're, everyone's going to be kind of looking out for that cave. They're supposed to have wildly different effects on the game. Some make the game harder or, you know, more complex, more simple, whatever, a little bit trickier. So that's super interesting to me. And, uh, there's something that reminds me of Bonanza as well, where you have these resources on your own player mat. And in Bonanza, you have these bean fields and you only have two of them and you want to keep acquiring the same type of beans so that, you know, when you harvest them, you get a big reward. But if you get a third type of bean, you have to get rid of some to make room for that. And on here, you're going to have resources that work that way. And the more resources you get, you're going to go up this little track and get rewards like the invention cards and stuff. But you might get a third type of resource and you're going to have to clear those off before you reach that reward point. So there's this little kind of like resource management type thing you have to do with your own board, but you're also competing for space. And then at the end of the game, you're going to be scoring points for having, you know, any regions that you have a hut in. If you have more huts than other players, you're going to score points for majorities and stuff like that. There's victory point cards you can get throughout. Everyone's going to start the game with a secret task card that you keep secret from everyone else. And at the end of the game, if you fulfilled that task, you get more points. I've basically explained a good chunk of the rules already. I won't go into it anymore. This is set to release uh, either, no, I think it's November 2021 in Europe, so next month, and hopes to make it to North America by early 2022, the latest. This one's an insta-buy for me just on the designer alone already. And then after reading the rules, I was like, okay, this is absolutely going into my collection as soon as I can get my hands on it. So you can totally expect to see some more coverage about this game uh, on our channel once I do have it at some point in 2022. That is Fire and Stone. All right, next one on the list here is another one that's very, you know, I might be biased here, um, and some of you might have no interest in this because if you're not really into sports or whatnot, but this is called Eleven Football Manager Board Game. Uh, this just had a game found uh, crowdfunding campaign that ended a couple weeks ago. This is designed by Thomas Janssen. Uh, it's with a J, but I believe it's Janssen. I believe he's Dutch. Um, also developed by Ignacy Trocevicek who is a, uh, the designer and CEO of Portal Games. This is art from Mateusz Kopacz, I believe I pronounced that correctly, hopefully, and Hannah Kuik, and this is published by Portal Games. So it's a one to four player game. Uh, the solo mode is actually pretty involved as well, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, takes about 60 to 120 minutes to play. And so the idea is it's not a game about playing soccer. Again, it's right in the title, Football Manager. And again, I'm gonna alternate between soccer and football. I know football is the more uh, universal term over across the world, but here in North America, I've been calling it soccer my whole life, but it is called the Football Manager board game. I um, mean, it's supposed to play off of, some of you might be familiar with the uh, video game or mobile app called Football Manager, where you're literally just managing a football team. You're not moving players around the field and kicking the ball in that, the, the actual football matches themselves are sort of simulated based on what you have. So this is an economic strategy game, um, and it's a re-implementation of a game from the same designer, Thomas Janssen, called Club Stories, which was released in 2018. So Ignacy Trecevicek, who is, again, uh, the head of Portal Games, is a huge soccer fan. Uh, if you follow Portal Games on Twitter, you'd have seen him posting all kinds of stuff throughout the Euros. Um, and basically, he, has, he reached out to Thomas Janssen, told him how much he loved this game and how much he wanted to help kind of re-implement and make this new version of it and kind of give it big, wider reach to, to, to get more people in it. So the idea is you're going to start the game by drafting a, a board of directors. You're going to have three directors and they have different kind of stats or different um, dice that they allow you to roll and different things that they lean towards. Like one is going to have certain style or certain things that they're trying to do with your, uh, with your club. And then the game is going to play out over eight rounds and each round has five days. Um, so the idea is... On Monday, you're going to be, um, it's going to be what's called the board meeting, which is basically an event card that says what, what you're kind of, what's, what are the conditions for this week? What's going on this week in the, in the soccer world? 
So you're gonna do that. You're gonna it's gonna give you some options, and based on your directors that you have, you're gonna have different options, or the dice will let you do different things um, and unlock. You know, you're gonna have your own player board where you have like you can have your economy, you can have your uh, you know you have a, your own you have stadium that you can upgrade. There's all kinds of infrastructure type stuff, and then Tuesday to Thursday, those three days, you're gonna play through one day at a time. And they're basically days where you can do stuff along the lines of hire players, sell players, uh, you can hire new staff like doctors, trainers, uh, like physical trainers. There's also mental trainers because we know sports psychology is a big thing. You can get tacticians, uh, trainers that are specific for your youngsters, which are your, you know, your rookies, your, your new players. Um, that kind of thing. You can also sign contracts with sponsors for more money. You can update your, like improve your stadium, all kinds of stuff. And then the fifth day in the game or whatever is match day which is the weekend so it's just kind of friday saturday sunday all combined and this is where there are some question marks still about the game and you know for some of you this might be a, a detriment or a negative i was a little on the fence about this at first um just full disclosure i pledged the one dollar amount for now because i don't know yet if i want to go all in on the game if i want to wait for retail if i want to get it with a couple expansions or i'm really on the fence right now the game is still being developed and to the credit of Portal Games, they've put a lot of, you know, they've been pretty open with the community and said, hey, we know that tons of people who are going to be interested in this game are very passionate uh, football fans and that they want to hear feedback. What do you think of this system? What do you guys want to see? Do you want to see this? They've already implemented tons of stuff from the community and I have to give them a lot of credit for, you know, a lot of the time these publishers will reach out and get, you know, ask for suggestions and then not really implement much or say, yeah, sure, we thought about that, but we're not interested. They spent a lot of time in the forums and in the comments section discussing with people and saying, okay, here's a new update for the game. We took your suggestions and we did this. And of course, there's some people who are like, that's awesome. Thanks for listening. I really like this update. Other people, no, I don't want that in the game. It's tough to please everyone. Um, you know, if you're a soccer fan or any type of sports fan in general, you'll know a lot of people have different opinions on things. So, um, but yeah, what, what happens on the match day is that it's not full on like the football manager video game where it just simulates a match, but it also isn't supposed to be an intricate thing where you're moving players around and making passes and whatnot. So there's basically going to be like a scouting report that comes out for your opposition. And it might say, you know, this team has a uh, really good defense or this team has a really deadly like left winger. And then you're going to be setting up your formation of players to kind of anticipate, it's not going to tell you exactly what you're going up against, but it's just, again, it's a scouting report, it's giving you a hint, and you're going to try and anticipate, and then go through the match and see what happens, and I don't know, I, I there are some things to work out, some of the playthrough videos I saw had like five or six players in the formation on one side of the field, and two on the other, which like just doesn't happen in soccer, like, there were some things that just, I felt like, if you're not going to be playing the actual soccer game, and if what you want is the football manager side of it, I felt like I hope the game doesn't focus too much on this actual playing of the matches. I would almost rather it be a little more simulated and, and a little more streamlined. I know some people wanted to actually be able to have more control over the matches, but I really want to stress that at the end of the eighth round, when the game ends and you're counting points, it's not just where are you in the standings. Like You could be first place in the standings, but it doesn't mean you win the game. Sure, that contributes to your point total, but again, it's about how well did you manage your club. So if you, you know hired youngsters and then sold them and made a huge profit or you're you know you had sponsors that helped you gain money throughout the game like you're being evaluated on so the position in the league table your objectives that you might have met players you've sold staff you've hired um stuff involving your stadium and infrastructure so it's basically assessing you as a manager of the club so i really like that i'm a huge soccer fan uh just quick shout out in case any of you are watching Borussia dortmund best team in the world uh, i hope there's some other fans out there if so let me know in the comments please i know a lot of people uh are all about the Premier League teams in England and whatnot, but uh, a huge Dortmund fan for, for quite some time now. But uh, either way, I'm really excited about this. This is set to be released in September 2022. At least that's when the Game Found will be uh, fulfilled. There's going to be a retail option as well, but you will miss out on the Game Found exclusive. You will be able to late pledge as well in early 2022. At least that's what Portal Games have said so far. So I'll leave it at that for now, but that is 11, the Football Manager board game. All right, next up on the list here is Luna Capital. This is a game I only heard about a few weeks ago. I believe it had a sort of big reveal at Gen Con. I don't know if it was announced previously, uh, but this is designed by Jose Ramon Palacios with artwork by Albert Montes and published by Devere Games, who uh, you might recognize as they published The Red Cathedral from 2020. And that's part of the reason why this game caught my eye in the first place. And I'm gonna be talking about The Red Cathedral later in the video for another reason as well. Uh, but this is a one to four player game that plays in about 45 minutes. It has card drafting and tile placement. Um, and if you're familiar with the word Luna means moon in Spanish, as well as probably some other languages as well. 
The idea is that you're going to be uh, competing with other players to create the most appealing kind of project uh, on the moon to become the capital of the moon. So if you've played, there's a lot of spatial elements here where you're going to be drafting cards and where they go matters, but also the cards have these, I think, four open spaces and you're taking project tiles when you draft as well and the tiles go in certain spaces and where the cards are next to each other matters, but also where the project tiles are on the cards matters. So there's some similarities to if you've played um, like Between Two Cities or Between Two Castles and Mad King Ludwig. A lot of other games do this, but this is one that stood out to me right away where it's like, you want, you know, for these uh, types of project tiles grouped together, you'll score this way. Or for these ones, you don't want them next to these types of tiles or whatever. And you're basically colonizing your little moon section. So you're going to be taking cards along with project tiles from the common area that are available to everyone. You're taking them into your hand or putting them in your little tableau. And you're going to be placing them next to each other. They're going to have numbers on them. And this aspect here kind of reminds me of Arboretum. Um, not fully in the sense that in Arboretum, if you're familiar, you're putting down cards and they have to be kind of in sequential order, but you can kind of snake them or go up and down. In in this game they have to be sequential like ascending order you know lower number to higher from left to right and you're going to be building out in three rows but let's say you have like a four and then they don't have to be in, in order but it can be like a four and then a five and then an eight and then let's say suddenly like from left to right then let's say suddenly you get like a number six you can't suddenly squeeze it in between you can't put it on the end so there's going to be these little tokens though that you can cover up the number six so now you can put that at the other end of the tableau and there's also going to be stuff where you can you know, these project tiles that you put down that might be like uh, orchards or uh, greenhouses, or sorry, oxygen collectors, greenhouses, residential complexes, and there's also going to be offices where you can sell apartments. But you're not as restricted in this game as a lot of these other spatial games where you put something there and it's stuck. First off, because as I mentioned, you have those little tokens that you'll be able to cover numbers on the cards with so you can place them out of order. But also you're going to have these like, I don't remember if they're called scaffolding or destruction tiles that you can place on top of a previous project tile to basically say you're destroying that and then you can put a new project tile over that new sort of destroyed location. Otherwise, once you put a tile down, you can't just move it out of there unless you actually take the time to destroy it and rebuild over it. So even though there is some randomness and some things, I really like these two aspects that sort of allow you to, I think it's going to decrease the analysis paralysis in the game because you're not going to feel like, you know, oh, I have to plan this perfectly because once this is here, if I get this other thing and they're too spaced apart, then I ruin my whole strategy, whatever. It's kind of allowing you to go ahead and kind of rearrange your plans later. Oh, I kind of made a mistake here, whatever. I'll do this thing to cover this up and rebuild something new later. So I really like that aspect. Um, that's pretty much all I know about it so far. I think the game plays over like 12 turns. It's not very long. Um, and the release date, I think they're still trying for this year. Uh, hopefully should make it before the end of 2021. If not, it looks like it'll be an early 2022 release. Um, never played anything by this designer before, but the artwork looks beautiful. And I'm really interested in most games now coming out from Devere Games after having played the Red Cathedral. So that is Luna Capital. All right, next up here is another one I'm really excited about. This one I have a personal bias to uh, for sure um, as someone Portuguese. I mean, I was born in Canada, um, but I have tons of family that was born in, my parents were born in Portugal, my grandparents, Dylan, who I go on the channel with, has tons of family in Portugal as well, who was born there. So like, we've gone there many, many times. This game is called Lisbon Tram 28. Um, on the box, it looks like just 28, but on the Board Game Geek page, it says Lisbon Tram 28. This is designed by Pedro Santos Silva with artwork from André Fernandes Trindade. People might say Fernandes, just so you know, in Portuguese, it's Fernandes. Uh, doesn't really matter, but I will uh, throw in these tidbits whenever we do these uh, Portuguese videos highlighted in here. And it's published by Mebo Games. So they do a lot of games with uh, Portuguese designers and games featured in like a location in Portugal. They released Porto in 2019, I believe, which I haven't had a chance to play yet. Um, but this is going to be a two to four player game that plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. Now, first off, I'll say right now, Lisbon is probably my favorite city in the world. I've been there many times. Uh, my parents own some property there. It's, it's an amazing, amazing place. I, I could talk about it for hours. I'm just going to skip right to the actually what's in the game, but it's about the famous number 28 Lisbon tram. So there's a tram that runs through Lisbon and the city has, it's known for, it's kind of like, maybe not known for, but one of the main features is it's seven hills. And so this tram takes people to all different monuments throughout the city. And so right when I heard about this game, it, it's, uh, it's sentimental to me because of how much I love the city, but also because even though I haven't myself been on the tram, I've walked along it many times, you hear the bell ringing, you know to look over your shoulder and get out of the way for the tram. It stops at all these kind of big places. So it basically has some similarities with like train games because there's networking and kind of 
uh, building your routes or going through what you're going to be doing throughout the game is picking up passengers dropping them off at different uh, famous monuments and basically fulfilling objectives by you know taking them to certain monuments you get these monument cards that get you points sort of thing so there's passengers of four different colors uh, red yellow blue and green and they're going to be at different stops and so um, you're going to be on your turn you basically take two actions There's four possible actions that you can take and you're going to take two You can take two of the same action or two different actions and those are basically you're going to be either movement Picking up passengers dropping passengers off at monuments or gaining a bonus for your player board So everyone has their own little player board where you can um, It looks like a little tram where you can keep two passengers of each color and then there's bonus Locations where you can you know because you're going to be having cards that are of the four colors as well in your hand and you can basically uh, discard or play three cards of the same color to gain a bonus that matches that color so some of the bonuses are you can now hold more players of the same color or you can take or more um, passengers of, of, of certain color or you can uh, you know get an extra movement every turn or there's little abilities that you get that basically are permanent now on your tram for the rest of the game so you're basically upgrading your tram uh, otherwise the movement is really interesting because it if you look at the board you can see that the like you can't always just go any direction like you have to follow the way a rail would actually go so sometimes you can't just move down to an area you have to go one way first and then kind of back up also there's only room for one tram on a spot so if you want to go where someone is you can kind of push them ahead and, and move into their spot uh, which is really cool um, the game just looks like it has fairly simple rules I read through most of the rule book and it just looks like a game That's gonna be fairly easy to get to the table with anyone It looks like it could be kind of that gateway game Maybe it's got slightly more complexity than ticket to ride it might even be easier than ticket to ride But it looks more interactive plays pretty quickly this I, I can't wait to get my hands on this game um, And another cool thing I got to mention real quick is the end game scoring the way that you get these monument cards And you go to these places that I've well, I've been to a lot of these the Torre de Belang the Castello de Saint Georges, which is a castle in the middle of the city that's just beautiful you know um i won't get into all of them again it's just sentimental for me but as you line up these cards are going to have these little tags on the side that represent the tickets of four different colors and at the end of the game you're going to have your tableau of cards that you've collected which are the monuments that's dropped passengers off at and if you line them up correctly and you have a, let's say a red ticket here on the right of one card and a red ticket on the left of another card and you put them side by side those tickets are connecting you're basically showing that a ticket of one color got you to three monuments or a ticket of a different color got you to one or four and those are bonus points so the rules seem really simple it's gonna be quick turns but a lot of interesting stuff and one feature I talked about that bell that you hear uh, from the tram 28 in Lisbon and there's an actual bell that comes with the game and I've seen a couple of videos where you ring and it's actually pretty loud and I imagine if you're playing this at like a convention or in a game store you're playing it at home and someone's in the other room like some people could find it annoying but for me I'm gonna absolutely love that because the amount of times I've been walking through Lisbon you know I'm walking with my geladu my ice cream or you know I've had a couple beers or whatever and then you just hear ding ding and you're like jumping out of the way and whatever like I don't know, there's something that just appeals to me about that. I think it's just a fun little, a nice little touch to add into the game. Uh, Board Game Dude currently said, it said September or Essen, which is coming up October 14th. I mean, by the time you see this video, it might have already happened. Um, but I'm hoping this makes it to North America by the end of the year. But if not, it might just be early 2022. But either way, I will absolutely be trying to get my hands on this. That is Lisbon Tram 28. Okay, next up on this list is a game called Boon Lake. So this is designed by Alexander Pfister, who you might recognize. I mean, his biggest game is Great Western Trail, but he's also done Maracaibo, uh, Isle of Sky, which is a game I really like by him. Uh, art from Clemens Franz, who's been around for a while, and also published by DLP Games. And I believe that's the publisher in Europe and maybe other parts of the world. And in North America, it'll be from Capstone Games. Uh, if you've seen this channel, you'll see we're big fans of Capstone Games. We featured a bunch of their stuff here before. This is a one to four player game that plays in 80 to 160 minutes it says average is probably going to be about two ish hours it's probably longer with more players but the basic idea is that you're kind of leaving the modern world behind and um, going in search like going into nature and you're basically going to live in the wilderness and you're going to the edge of a lake boon lake uh, that has barely been explored but some people are starting to kind of explore it and the, what really pulled me into this game was a very interesting action selection mechanism where basically on your turn there's going to be these action tiles I think there's seven of them in the game that are on the board and they're in this little action board that has you know depending which spot you take it from there's a corresponding uh, kind of bonus or effect that happens so depending where you take it from it's going to tell you you can move your boat this many space or up to this many spaces down the river so if there's a three you take that action tile you can move your space your boat one two or three spaces down this river so what makes this action selection uh, thing really interesting is it's kind of divided into three things. There's one thing where when you take it, if you have a card that has the matching symbols on it, you can play a card from your hand. 
Then the middle of the tile is going to tell you what action you can take and you're going to be able to take that action. And then the right of the tile is going to determine the action that all of your opponents can take. And this is super interesting to me because every single decision, you have to be weighing what you're allowing your opponents to do when you do something. Um, and the other thing that's cool about it is wherever you take it from, I already mentioned different spots on the board will give you a different bonus. So if it ends up being at the bottom of the track, you're going to have to pay more for it maybe and that sort of thing. But let's say you take it from the middle of that action. Let's say out of the seven tiles, you take the middle one. Then you have to basically slide up the other one to close that gap and put it at the bottom. So the order of where they are is going to change. Depending what you take, it might push another tile up or down or whatever, changing, you know, the bonuses that your opponents are going to get from their next turn or the effects or how far down the river they're going to be able to move. Really interesting stuff. The game is going to play over only two rounds. Basically, the, the minute that some any player's boat reaches the end of the river, because you can't go back up the river, it's kind of downstream. When you get to the end of the river, that's going to trigger the end of the round, even if the other players aren't there yet. Um, you'll do scoring then, as well as at the halfway point of the round. And then you'll start the next round back at the top of the river kind of thing. And then there'll be another interim scoring that happens halfway down, and then a fourth and final scoring that happens uh, again at the end of the second round when someone's boat reaches the end. So the last thing I want to mention real quick actually about the rules is that every player actually gets a goal at the start, and the longer you wait to fulfill the goal, uh, the tougher it's going to be, but the more points it'll get you. So a lot of interesting stuff in this game, very anticipated uh, on my list. Um, it looks like it's going to be releasing either this month, October, or possibly November, um, pending any potential delays. So I will be keeping an eye out for that one, and hopefully we'll feature or some of it, something about it on our channel in the future. That is Boon Lake. Okay, next up on the list is a game called, pardon me if I butcher the pronunciation here, it's called Shinkansen Zero K. So this is designed by Israel Sendrero and Sheila or Sheila Santos. They often go by uh, Isra C and She S. Um, they designed the Red Cathedral, which is what caught my eye about this game in the first place. I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, the art in this game is by Loka Made Studio with graphic design from David Prieto, and it's published by Ludo Nova, who previously did Babylonia, which was one of my favorite games from 2019. Amazing, amazing game. Uh, this is a game for one to four players that plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. And the idea is that there's the sort of Tokaido train line of the Shinkansen that was started uh, being built in 1959. And it was the goal of it was to be the fastest train in the world at the time. This was leading up to the Olympics in Tokyo in 1964. And you play as the builders of this train and you're gonna be helping some of the Olympic uh, venues along the way. The game is playing over five rounds uh, with three phases each. You're basically gonna start by preparing, which will reveal an event card um, and some new carriage cards that are available to players. You'll gain income and that sort of thing. The second phase will be that you purchase new carriages and you're adding these carriages and actions um, and, or sorry, then you're purchasing new carriages and the third one is adding new carriages and actions. So there's gonna be a different number of actions that you can take each round depending on the event card that comes out. And so let's say you can take three or four actions. You don't have to, it's just saying how many you can. And for each one that you don't take, you gain one money or one yen. Um, you can use other players' cards throughout the game, but you have to pay them to use them. You're gonna be being, laying down tracks and building stations along the way kind of thing, but you really have to be careful what you're investing in and what you're going, what plans you're gonna be able to see through to the end. Like, even though it kind of, you know, when you look at the artwork and stuff, it looks like this kind of friendly game and it's 45 minutes to an hour, you think, oh, you know, maybe like I can play with my family kind of thing. It isn't one of those games where like, you know, we talk about these feel good kind of point salad games where it's like, oh, everything you do is gonna get you points. It's just a matter of how many points you're gonna get. You can actually lose points at the end of the game. Like if your city doesn't have um, you know, any, any tracks going to it, you're actually going to get negative points. Or if you have tracks, but no stations, then you're not going to get any points for the tracks. You'll just get zero points for that. So it is a game that seems like you, you could do very poorly. Like you could be punished for playing it poorly. I imagine that there's going to be people who might play it once and do very poorly and think, oh man, I don't even, I didn't like this game or I feel bad about how, how poorly I did. Um, but I kind of like that in games a lot. I mean, not in every game, but, um, what caught my eye about this though, again, is when I mentioned the designer team, uh, Isra C and Shayla S. The, the Red Cathedral is a game I'd heard a lot about that I only played recently. It's a 2020 game. And I was just totally blown away by, the, the overall package of how like the price point is like a $30 game. The components were super nice. Uh, the box was pretty small. Like it doesn't take up a lot of room on the shelf. And yet there's a lot to think about. And I, you don't often see this in games. A lot of the time games are like overproduced in the sense that like the box is too big or, you know, it feels like it's overpriced or anything. And I was not many games get it as right as the Red Cathedral did for me, uh, especially from 2020. And I just thought it was something that like Publishers everywhere should be taking note of that type of game and trying to give us more of that type of experience. And those that design pairing 
sort of came out of nowhere for me and I, I really, I've only tried it once solo, but I really enjoy the Red Cathedral already. And that's why when I heard of this game, I almost dismissed it because I'm not usually super intrigued by train type games. But as soon as I saw who it was designed by, I told myself, okay, I got to look into this more. And the more I, I read through the rule book, uh, sort of not fully, but skimmed through it. Um, and it just like, there's some interesting end game scoring again. And um, it just gives you what seems like a lot of choices from a relatively simple rule set and seems like a game that has um, a lot to bring you back to, for more to try and feel like you want to do better because of how difficult it seems like it is and how much your your planning and seeing your plans through really matters. So uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say about it right now. It says the release date was supposed to be potentially this month at Essen happening in Germany. Um, otherwise, later this year or early 2022 at the latest, it might only hit North America in early 2022, but I will be keeping an eye out for that. Um, we might be able to feature it on the channel in the future. So that is Shinkansen 0K. Okay, and now last, but certainly not least, um, for some of you, I might've saved the best for last. This might end up even being my favorite from all these games once I actually play it, is a game called Dice Realms. This is designed by Tom Lehman, who is an incredible designer, has designed two of my favorite, like Race for the Galaxy, which is absolutely one of my top games of all time. Uh, he's also designed Res Arcana from 2019, which is an amazing tableau building game as well. Um, not quite as high on my list as Race for the Galaxy. He's designed a bunch of other games kind of in the race, he's in a Roll for the Galaxy and Jump Drive. I haven't played those yet, um, but the, the, the designer is what really pulled me into this game, as well as the publisher, which is Rio Ground Games. Uh, and the artwork is from Martin Hoffman and Klaus Steffen, or Steven. This is a two to four player game that plays in 45 to 60 minutes. And the idea is that each player uh, is playing, has their realm, and basically it's represented by these customizable dice. So if you've ever played Dice Forge, that's, that's the one that comes to mind. There are probably other games like this, but customizable dice, by that I mean there's faces of the die that you can basically clip on that give you new abilities. So you're going to be, throughout the game, I think there is, what is it? more than 650 plastic die faces that are gonna come in this thing. Like this is gonna be a massive box. I think the retail price is listed at 120 bucks US, um, but 650 plastic die of 72 types, 35 tiles that provide more than 320 unique starting setups apparently. And so you're gonna be throughout the game buying more uh, dice, but you're also gonna be buying upgrades to either improve your dice and stick on these new things or uh, expand your realm. So when I say expand your realm, that's when you're gonna buy more dice, but, and they kind of represent people. And every time you buy more dice, you need more grain to kind of feed your people. So there's gonna, on your turn, you're gonna be rolling your own dice, but you're also gonna be rolling this fate die, uh, which I believe applies to everyone at the table. And for example, like if it's winter, you need to feed your people, and there's gonna be different things that come up that address what you have to do in the game. You'll be able to sometimes re-roll dice. You're gonna be resolving attacks that come up on dice. You're gonna be trying to defend against these to defend your realm. Um, and you're basically gonna be, you know, collecting grain and victory points and then spending the coins that you have to, again, expand your realm with new dice and improve the dice that you have. And then you're gonna, that's kind of the round, basic round structure, you're gonna do it all over again. I don't know a whole lot more about the game other than that kind of basic structure, but again, the fact that Tom Lehman has designed this um, and Rio Grande Games is publishing it and just the kind of like customizable dice. I, there were certain things I liked about Dice Forge. I've played it a couple times on Board Game Arena and it was fun, but ultimately it wasn't a game I ever felt the need to own or seek out playing again. I'd happily play it again, it was fine. Um, but something like this is, it seems like the kind of, I don't know if trademark's the right word, maybe, but uh, Tom Lehman, Race for the Galaxy and, and uh, Res Arcana are both tableau builders. They have a lot of that engine building where you have to decide at some point you're building your engine, building your engine, but at some point you almost have to decide when are you satisfied with the engine you have and when do you shift from your main goal being building the engine to actually like racing to get points and trying to get ahead of your competitors. When are you satisfied enough and confident in your engine and you can sh kind of shift gears and say, now I'm going to go for points rather than keep building your engine, building your engine. And then suddenly the game ends and you think, oh, I should have been going for points rather than building an engine and upgrading these dice that I didn't even get to roll kind of thing. So super interested in this game. It's supposed to be released by December, 2021 this year. I hope it gets to North America by then. It might end up being an early 2022 game as a bunch of them on this list are. Um, but yeah, this is one I'm super excited about. You should absolutely check out this game online. Again, the price point is high, but for what components are in there, it sounds like it's gonna be worth it. Um, very high hopes about this one. That is Dice Realms. And that is the last game on the list. So those are the seven I'm very excited about. Um, which of these games are you most looking forward to now? We've talked about them here. 
Are there one or two here that really stand out? Uh, maybe there's other games that I kind of missed or that we, we might have even covered them in previous videos where we talked about other games. Sometimes people are like, oh, have you heard of this one? And we actually covered it on a previous video, but I'm interested to hear too, are there other games? Before I made this video, I think there was, I had a short list of about 14 or 15 games and I had to narrow it down to these seven. So there's a bunch of them. I'm sure either myself or Dylan, one of us will have another one of these videos coming out sooner rather than later talking about some other games. Um, but otherwise, I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Leave us a comment below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this and all sorts of other stuff. Otherwise, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.